Questions orales, l'honorable député de Foothills. With plummeting polls in Atlantic Canada, this Prime Minister is panicked, desperate, and making it up as he goes along. Only a year ago, Liberal MPs voted against a Conservative motion to axe a carbon tax from home heating. What a difference a year makes. I know my farmers in Alberta are sure wondering what it takes for them to get some relief from this Prime Minister's carbon tax. But yesterday, the Prime Minister admitted that his carbon tax is unaffordable. So how much worse do the polls have to get for the Prime Minister to axe his carbon tax for all Canadians? Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When we came into power in 2015, projected emissions growth in Canada, so pollution levels were going, was going to increase by to 80 million tons by 2030. We brought this down 80 million tons, more than 80 million tons, in fact, and since then we've reduced it by another 50 million tons, Mr. Speaker. So that's more than 100 million tons of pollution that Canada won't have to endure because of us, despite the Conservative Party of Canada. We're only getting started, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan to fight climate change and to help Canadians with affordability. We'll keep going at it. Well, the Prime Minister presses pause on his carbon tax in Atlantic Canada. The Liberals are blocking a Conservative bill that will exempt the carbon tax from on-farm fuels, making food more affordable. I guess the desperate pleas of Canadian farmers don't have the same weight as the Prime Minister's plummeting polls in Atlantic Canada. But let's be clear. Putting a pause is only a move of desperation for this Prime Minister, who will double down, as this Minister just said, on his pledge to quadruple the carbon tax. Again, the Prime Minister's admitted his carbon tax is unaffordable. When will he axe his carbon tax for all Canadians? Mr. Speaker, as my father used to say, when you point the fingers, there's always three fingers pointing back at you. When it came time to, to decrease funding to farmers, the leader of the official opposition sat on his hand at the cabinet table. When it came time to increase funding to farmers, all Conservatives and peace sat on their hands. And on C-234, if it was so important for the leader of the official opposition, he should have sat on his hand and worked a little harder. Foothill. The Liberals don't care about food costs or affordability. Canadians are struggling to put food on the table after eight years of this Liberal NDP government. Almost two million Canadians accessed a food bank in March. That's up 79% from March of 2019. A third of those people using food banks are children. And almost 20% of Canadian families are food insecure. A, a Prime Minister who is in desperation mode is not worth the cost. Again, the Prime Minister has admitted his carbon tax is unaffordable. When will he axe that tax for all Canadians so they can afford to put food on the table? Mr. Speaker, we know that right now many Canadian families are struggling with increased costs. Last night, I was speaking with Faye. And Faye shared with me that he came to Canada with his family five years ago from Syria. And he shared the impact that the Canada Child Benefit had on his family, enabled them to ensure that they could buy food and the things that their children needed. This is one story, Mr. Speaker, of the 3.5 million Canadian families that receive this benefit each and every month. The Honourable Member for Megantic-Lérable. Mr. Speaker, 800,000 Quebecers are resorting to food banks every month. That's one Quebecer in 10. 30 percent more in one year. 73 percent more than in 2019. And what's worse, 70 percent of food banks are running short of food and the Liberals want to hike the carbon tax, which will increase the cost of everything. When will the Prime Minister scrap the second carbon tax of 20 cents a litre that he's imposed on all Quebecers? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. 
And it's clear, Mr. Speaker, we are in the heat of the action. We're stabilizing grocery prices for Canadians. There's the Canada Child Benefit, which continues to put money in the pockets of Canadians and Quebecers. Mr. Speaker, the carbon tax doesn't apply in Quebec, and the member knows that full well. Mr. Speaker, we are here to support Quebecers and Canadians, and we will continue getting the job done. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. Well, they're missing in action because uh, yesterday in a newspaper article it said that over 800,000 Quebecers are resorting to food banks. It's a national embarrassment. That's the legacy of eight years of Liberal government. And further on, it says the face of poverty is changing. Workers, women, students, uh, university students uh, are all resorting to food banks. The lim Liberals are plummeting in the polls. Will the Prime Minister scrap the second carbon tax that he's imposed on all Quebecers, yes or no? Mr. Speaker, once again, on this side of the House, we recognize that many Canadian families are facing challenges. Just last week, I had the opportunity to visit the Eden, Eden Food for Change uh, in the riding of Mississauga Aaron Mills. And that institution, that organization, helps to feed individuals each and every day. Through the Community Services Recovery Fund, we've put $400 million into these community organizations to help address these problems. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Mr. Speaker, Radio Canada re revealed that the Liberals are considering revising downward immigration thresholds for 2026 because of the housing crisis. The minister even confirmed he planned to say more on November 1st, but Ottawa is still reviewing its thresholds without talking to Quebec and the provinces. Quebec and the provinces are responsible for health care, education, enculturation, infrastructure, and the list goes on. They're the only ones who know their capacity for successful immigration. So will the government commit to consulting them and adjusting thresholds according to provincial settlement capacity. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member opposite knows full well, Quebec sets its own immigration levels. They can choose francophone uh, applicants and they will build the housing they need and provide the jobs for those people. Mr. Speaker, we always respect Quebec's jurisdiction around immigration and newcomers are in, in, in undeniably part of the solution. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Mr. Speaker, it's curious. Yesterday, when the Bloc was talking about revising thresholds, the Liberals accused us of being anti-immigration. But when the Liberals revise the thresholds, as they're doing now, that doesn't mean they're anti-immigration. When it's them, it's fine. When it's someone else, it's bad. Mr. Speaker, on the initiative of the Bloc on Tuesday, we'll be, discuss we'll be discussing those immigration thresholds. Will we be able to have an intelligent debate without the Liberals suggesting that everyone but them is in Tolerant. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Bloc wants us to stand up for immigrants in Quebec, and we're happy to be a part of the solution. Quebec has the exclusive power, though, to select the vast majority of immigrants coming to Quebec. And under the Canada Quebec Accord, Quebec also receives financial compensation from the federal government. So we respect Quebec jurisdiction around immigration, and we work very well. We are working very well with the government of Quebec. That government is a good partner for us. The New Westminster, Burnaby. We're seeing a housing crisis across the country, and Halifax is seeing one of the worst in Canada. People are forced to live in parks and in their cars. Women fleeing violence have nowhere to go when their stay at a shelter, and students can't find a home they can afford. Now, Liberals and Conservatives finger point, but between them, these two parties have lost over a million affordable homes over the last 17 years. When will the Liberals finally build the homes people desperately need so no one has to sleep on the streets in Halifax? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, 70,000 new units for individuals who have experienced homelessness. 
122,000 people who are close to being homeless are not homeless because of the national housing strategy. That applies to what I just said before on homelessness. That member rightly brings up the, the plight and position of women who experience homelessness. Over 400 units of shelter, either renovated or constructed, through this, go this government's investments. We have more to do. It's not an acceptable situation, but we will get it done. Here, here. Then I have New Westminster, Burnaby. The Liberals say they're not making things worse, but they're certainly not making things better. Now, here's the reality of yet another Canadian. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Stephanie Finlinson of Woodstock, Ontario, has been struggling to make ends meet. Big corporations who make record profits are gouging people like Stephanie at the grocery store, at the pumps, with bank fees, and with their cell phone bills. After working full time and paying her monthly bills, she only has $9 left for food. Under this Liberal government, people are going under, and Conservatives have no interest in cracking down on corporate greed. When is this government going to put something in place to protect Stephanie from this ongoing corporate gouging? Thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. While well, our government is stepping up to uh, fight inflation and alleviate the pressures in our economy to uh, address the affordability challenges that Canadians are under, uh, we see the Conservatives shudder at even the thought of standing up to corporations. We brought them to the table. They've produced action plans. We're updating our competition laws. And I wish all members of this House would get on side and vote in support, uh, support of our Affordability Act. L'Honorable Député de South Shore, St. Margaret's. A year ago, the Liberal MP from St. John's East, in a show of great compassion to Atlanta Canadians, said he was sick and tired about hearing from people complaining about the cost of heating. Hmm. Then he said his fellow Liberal, then his, he and his fellow Liberals voted against removing the carbon tax from home heating. And after eight years, NDP Liberals now admit the carbon tax is hurting people and it's not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister admit the pain he has caused and axe the entire carbon tax? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know that climate change is real, and Nova Scotians know that climate change is real. Over the past two years, we've had fires, we've had floods, we have hurricanes. But we've also heard that, Can that Nova Scotians need help and they need time. And that's why I'm proud that our government has incentivized heat pumps and created incentives for medium and low-income families to ensure that they can make the transition to clean and affordable energy. Our government is committed to addressing climate change, and we will be there to help all Canadians make that change. Good job. The Honourable Deputy de South Shore St. Margaret's. The announcement he referenced is from a panicking, plummeting Prime Minister. And after eight years, even that panicking Prime Minister now admits his carbon tax is not working. Yet the NDP Liberal government continues to punish Canadians with a carbon tax on everything. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. 1,000 people last night in Nova Scotia demanded the Liberals axe the tax. When will the Prime Minister do his job and axe the entire carbon tax? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we want to save people money and fight climate change at the same time. We know that a price on pollution reduces emissions and puts more money in the pockets of middle class families. We also know that many families who use home heating oil in Atlantic Canada are having trouble making the switch, a switch that they want to make, Mr. Speaker, to a cleaner and cheaper source of heat, particularly in rural communities. That's why we're pausing the price on pollution on home heating oil for three years, doubling the rural rebate and creating a new program to deliver cleaner, more affordable heat pumps to families in the region while we save them thousands of dollars every year. It's been eight long, miserable years with this NDP Liberal government. A year ago, they voted to keep the carbon tax on home heating, and now they're in full panic mode with polling numbers in free fall. Their new re-election slogan is, elect them that will only quadruple the carbon tax right after the next election. No relief either for the second carbon tax the Prime Minister has piled on. My constituents know this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. When will the NDP Liberal government admit that their carbon tax is punishing Albertans and axe the entire carbon tax? Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What we announced yesterday is that we were going to double the rural top-up for Canadians who benefit from the implementation of carbon pricing. We will also, through a pilot project, make it free for Atlantic Canadians who want to switch to heat pumps, which will enable them to save $2,000 per year, Mr. Speaker. What is, it, what is it the Conservatives don't like about it? I'll tell you what they don't like about it. It's making Canadians less dependent from their big oil friends. That's what they don't like about it. They want Canadians to continue paying for inefficient, polluting and pricey system. Not, that's not what we want to do on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. Then I have Deputy to Calgary Shepherd. It's obvious that side is in panic mode because of falling polling numbers. So they're, they're serving us election gimmicks. This week's Food Bank report says that one in six Canadians are working hungry. They're working and are going to the food bank. Herman, in my writing, tells me he's been going to the food bank for almost two years. So does his brother and two of his friends. Another constituent told me he's okay. He's only skipping one meal a day and he's having cereal for the two other days. Herman and my constituents know this. The Prime Minister is not worth the cost. When will the NDP Liberal government treat Albertans fairly and axe the entire tax so they can put food on their dinner tables? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Mr. Speaker, it's hard to take these champagne Conservatives seriously as they continue to stand up in this House and speak to the hardships that Canadians are feeling while every step of the way they oppose the very measures that our government has consistently put forward to help the most vulnerable. Measures like the Canada Child Benefit offering families hundreds of dollars per month to support their children and child care, which is saving families hundreds of dollars per month. Instead of weaponizing Canadians' hardship for political gain, perhaps they could consider supporting me real measures that help Canadians, like the Affordability Act. Before I proceed to the next question, I would ask all members on all sides of the House to please uh, keep your comments to the time that you're recognized and you have the floor so that all members can listen to the questions and to the answers. The Honourable Member from uh, Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mark is a local grocery store owner in Dawson City. Mark has seen his already high shipping costs get slapped with a 94% fuel surcharge because of this Prime Minister's carbon tax. Uh, a dozen eggs is $8. A pound of butter is $9. And get this, a kilogram of cheese is $30. You Connors know they simply can't afford this Prime Minister any longer. Will this NDP Liberal government finally stop punishing Yukoners and axe their carbon tax? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Canada Energy Regulator estimates that wind power will provide about 30% of total Canada's supply in 2050, compared to less than 6% in 2021. Now, according to a recent study by the Public Policy Forum, Offshore wind could be for Atlantic Canada what, and I call oil, oil was for Texas or hydropower for Quebec. This is transformational for Atlantic Canada. My, I think a lot of Canadians, Mr. Speaker, are wondering why are, are the, is the Conservative Party opposing the development of clean renewable energy for Atlantic Canadians and, in fact, for all Canadians, Mr. Speaker? For the question, Minister. Then I have Deputy to Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Despite this Prime Minister's fancy photo ops uh, yesterday, Yukoners are facing a cold winter where they have to decide between keeping their kids warm or keeping them fed. Carbon tax is causing transportation costs to double and food prices to skyrocket. Instead of making it better for struggling Yukoners, this NDP Liberal government is making it worse. After eight years, this Prime Minister simply isn't worth the cost. Yukoners want to know, Will they end, in its entirety, the carbon tax? When? Mr. Speaker, I respect the honourable member across the way speaking for the people of Yukon. We have a fantastic member of parliament on this side that actually represents the Yukon. And Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that the investments that we are making in that territory are transformational investments in our tourism industry, in making sure that we have climate resiliency. Mr. Speaker, what the Conservatives have against climate change is the fact that they don't believe in it. They ran on a policy to actually fight climate change. Now they're under new management. They don't care. We're due. We're going to fight climate change for you, Connors, and all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne. 
Mr. Speaker, once again, this government is going it alone, threatening the survival of a quarter million businesses. Everyone's asking the government to defer repayment of the SIBA loans for another year. The premiers of Quebec and the provinces, the National Assembly, unanimously, the Federation of Independent Business, the Restaurant Association, everyone's on the same side, the entrepreneur's side, except the federal government. When will they stop stubbornly standing alone against the world and offer the deferrals everyone's asking for? Then I have six the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, and I'd like to thank uh, the member opposite for her question uh, and her continuous advocacy for small businesses across Canada. Mr. Speaker, the SEBA program provided unprecedented support to nearly 900,000 small businesses and helped them keep their doors open and keep the lights on. Last year, our government extended the forgiveness qualification deadline by one year to the end of this year. We know times are still tough for small businesses, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we recently announced a full one-year extension on the term loan repayment. We will continue to be there for small businesses throughout Canada, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Tarbonne. Mr. Speaker, repeating what the government has done in the past won't stop any of the quarter million businesses threatened with bankruptcy in 2024. No one's attacking their record. Everyone's asking what they're going to do today. They need to open up a direct channel of communication with small businesses to offer them personalized solutions and a reasonable extension. The solution is in their hands. What are they going to do today to avoid a wave of bankruptcies? What's the government going to do today? Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Look, the bottom line is that uh, we've been listening to businesses across the country. And if, and if uh, you're a small business and, and you do not currently have the funds to repay your SIBA loan, you now have three years to repay it in full. The additional flexibility that we announced is significant support for small businesses who might still be struggling to make, the, make it ends meet, Mr. Speaker. The SEBA program delivered more than $49 billion to nearly 900,000 small businesses. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to support small businesses as we all recover from the pandemic. Thank you. Then I have Deputy de Regina Wiscana. Mr. Speaker, a report released this week by Food Banks Canada shows that more Canadians are relying on food banks than at any time since 1989. And it's no surprise. The carbon tax applies to the farmers who grow the food, the truckers who truck the food, and the grocers who refrigerate the food. Clearly, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Mr. Speaker, after eight long years, will this Liberal NDP government finally completely cancel its inflationary carbon tax. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, Mr. Speaker, our government has demonstrated uh, through action that we really care about the struggles, struggles that Canadians are facing. But it's hard to take these Johnny-come-lately Conservatives seriously. When the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food came to Canada in 2012, he documented that 55% of households on social assistance were food insecure. And said it was the inadequacy of social protections that led to the burden on the food banks. So what did the Conservative Harper, Harper Conservatives do, Mr. Speaker? The Conservatives fed Canadians a nothing burger for almost a decade. So they're reckless. To be responsible and just the, the, the Honourable Member from Chatham Kent, Leamington. Mr. Speaker, one year ago, the Liberal MPs voted to keep the carbon tax on home heating. Sure. Yesterday, the Prime Minister flip flopped. Why? Polling numbers. Yesterday's announcement of the pause on the carbon tax on home heating won't help 97% of Canadians. Canadians can see this for what it is. After eight years, this NDP Liberal government is just not worth the cost. The common sense Conservative promise is simple. No gimmicks, no temporary measures. Will the panicking, plummeting Prime Minister admit he cares more about polls than Canadians and will he now axe the entire carbon tax? Here, here, here. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for his questions. But look, he ran on a 
plan to actually fight climate change and then threw it out the window when they got a new chief executive officer for their party. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, all they want to do is take us back to a time when polluters could actually pollute for free. And Mr. Speaker, our plan is going to allow Atlantic Canadians to shift from a high GHG fuel to a solution that is actually going to lower GHGs in perpetuity. That means for the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, forever. We're going to keep fighting climate change. They can keep complaining that we're actually doing the right thing on behalf of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. The Liberal carbon tax does have an impact in Quebec. The second Liberal carbon tax will cost up to 20 cents a litre more for gas, and all this with block support. More money in Ottawa and less money in Quebecers' pockets. After eight years of Liberal government, one Quebecer in 10 is resorting to food banks. The Liberals with the Bloc want to uh, create a new tax when people in Quebec are suffering. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my Honourable Colleague for his question. And I'd also like to remind him that what he's talking about is a clean fuel standard, which was in the Conservative Party platform in the 2021 election. However, despite having campaigned on such a measure because it would help reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the oil patch, and there have already been $2 billion worth of investments all across the country in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and even in Quebec, but the the Conservatives would scrap all those investments and all that program creation. Donald, member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, where was the minister last year? Because on October 24, 2022, we voted on a motion here which the Conservatives proposed to scrap the carbon tax on home heating. And just yesterday, the Liberals flip flopped and suddenly said they supported that idea. Mr. Speaker, the fact is, if people in the Atlantic region are going to get a break, what about Quebecers? What about Montrealers? Are they going to give them a tax too, a break too, and scrap the carbon tax? The Honourable Minister, it's true, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's hard to follow all the information about climate change. And I can understand why my friend opposite is a bit confused. So the clean fuel standard applies all across Canada. It applied yesterday, it applies today, it applies in Atlantic Canada, in Quebec, Alberta, or even BC. It's completely different from the carbon tax. And the investments are creating hundreds of jobs, including among farmers who are going to produce canola and so on. But if the Conservatives took office, all of that would disappear. And I have deputy to North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, on Wednesday in my riding, a 13-year-old overdosed at a local business. Luckily, a nurse and local firefighters saved her life, and I am so grateful. In BC alone, more than 1,800 have died this year due to the toxic drug supply. The Liberals have delayed mental health funding while people die. And the Conservatives, they want to punish people who are struggling. When will the Liberals deliver a national health-based plan to address the toxic drug crisis? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank the member for the very, very serious question. Since 2016, our government has had a view that we need a, a comprehensive, collaborative and evidence-based substance use policy with harm reduction and treatment as the key part. This is a public health issue, not a criminal one, and must be addressed the way alongside well-trained, monitored and resourced public safety components. People who are struggling, Mr. Speaker, need everyone at the table, everyone in this room. The federal government working with provinces and territories on a system that includes health and mental health term services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, leaked emails from Global Affairs Canada revealed that the government has no plan for over 400 Canadians desperately trying to flee Gaza and hundreds more in the West Bank. In Gaza, they have no food. They have no water and the hospitals are crumbling. The minister and the prime minister have no answers for Canadians and they refuse to call for an end to Israel's siege and a full ceasefire. 
What's the plan to evacuate Canadians out of Gaza and the West Bank? How many Canadians and Palestinians will die before the Liberals call for a ceasefire? The Honourable Minister for International Development. Our priority has always been and will always be the safety and security of Canadians. We continue to call for the immediate release of all hostages and demand that they be treated in accordance with international law. We've also sent a team of experts to the region to support the work of securing their release. Uh, with respect to the larger number of Canadians who are trying to evacuate from Gaza, myself, minister, uh, the, the Foreign Affairs Minister and our Prime Minister have been doing everything that we can to work with our partners in the region and beyond to, to enable them to evacuate safely and securely from Gaza. The Honourable Deputy de St. John's East. Mr. Speaker, when Canadians needed support during the pandemic, community organizations and charities stepped up to provide crucial assistance. Now, many of them are having difficulty generating revenue, managing increased costs and demand for services, and attracting and retaining paid staff and volunteers. Can the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development update Canadians on the progress that has been made to support these organizations? Mr. Speaker, through the Community Services Recovery Fund, nearly 5,500 organizations nationwide have been funded. In the members' riding of St. John East, that means groups like the Association of New Canadians is now better able to support newcomers. The Food Producers Forum, Bell Island Community Food Bank, and the Newfoundland and Labrador Food Umbrella can continue feeding their community. These are local groups, Mr. Speaker, that are making a real difference in St. John's East. Honourable Deputy de Paris Saint Muskoka. This NDP Liberal government's inflationary spending is making everything more expensive, proving once again that the Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Food Banks Canada has reported that March of this year, almost 2 million Canadians visited food banks. That's a 78.5% increase since March of 2019. Rent has doubled, mortgages have doubled, and the number of Canadians needing food banks is skyrocketing. So when will this coalition government end their wasteful inflationary spending so Canadians can afford to eat? Mr. Speaker, every day in this House, Conservatives stand up uh, and talk about the lineups at our food banks as if food security in this country or food insecurity just became a thing. While our government created the first ever national food policy for Canada, invested in the local food infrastructure fund, invested over $100 million on food security organizations during COVID-19, and advanced social protections that lifted 2.7 million Canadians out of poverty, what did the Stephen Harper Conservatives do, Mr. Speaker? Nada. Nothing. Zilch. So if the Conservatives have finally woken up to the fact that food security is a need in this country, they can vote for the affordability. Act. The Honourable Member from Paris Sound Muskoka. Well, Mr. Speaker, we know that food insecurity is not a new thing. It's only been getting worse under this Liberal yeah, NDP yeah. coalition. In fact, 67% of those using food banks this year were living in market rental housing and paying so much they couldn't afford groceries. What's worse is children now make up 33% of food bank clients. So the NDP Liberal talking points and photo ops are clearly not working. So when would they end their inflationary spending so we can keep roofs over our heads and kids out of food banks? Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food reported as many as 4.3 million Canadians were food insecure in 2011 and said, and I quote, a growing number of people across Canada are unable to meet their basic food needs. That was in the dark era of the Conservatives for almost a decade where food insecurity continued to get worse and worse and worse. So I don't know when the Conservatives finally woke up and realized that this was a major issue in this country, but they did nothing for over a decade. So here we are addressing the issue, lifting 2.7 million Canadians out of poverty. I wish they would get on board and do something for once to actually support Canadians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Mr. Speaker, the disastrous Trudeau economic legacy, 14 deficits in 15 years in the wow. 70s and 80s, led to untold devastation for Canadian families and massive cuts to Canadian health care spending and critical federal programs for seniors and families. After eight more long years, that family legacy has now resulted in 20 consecutive deficit budgets under Prime Minister Trudeau and his son. That family legacy is definitely not worth the cost. Some are now saying that we will spend more on interest payments this year than we do on the Canada health transfer. Is that true? Here, here. Speaker, maybe the uh, honourable member from the south of Edmonton forgot or had amnesia over the 10 dark years under the Harper government, and quite frankly, he is one of the silent Conservative voices, 30 silent Conservative voices, MPs all from Alberta, Mr. Speaker, saying nothing about Danielle Smith's reckless and irresponsible attempt to take Albertans out of the CPP. Is he happy to scare seniors in his riding? Is he happy to destabilize CPP for the country, Mr. Speaker? Shame on him and his whole party for being silent and scaring Alberta and Canadian seniors. Then I have Deputy Edmonton with Taskwin. Mr. Speaker, when each faced a global crisis, our governments definitely took distinctly different routes. Our Conservative government ran targeted, time-limited deficits and laid out a timeline to get back to balance by 2015, which we did. This Liberal Prime Minister, on the other hand, announced that the crisis was an opportunity to reimagine our economy and embarked on a wild-eyed experiment that has our country teetering on the edge of financial devastation. My question again, will this government spend more this year on interest than we do on the Canada health transfer? Yes or no? Wow. Speaker, and the honourable member across is really good at cherry-picking facts. I can tell you conversations that I had with Conservative members of Parliament during the middle of the pandemic. You know what they said, Mr. Speaker? They said, forget the loan programs, forget the ability to help people to actually pay their rent. You know what they said, Mr. Speaker? They said, let the market decide. What did they want to have? Bread lines and poverty and decimation in our streets. Shame on them for screaming people about CPP and shame on them for revisionist history. This is a government that supports Canadians and has lifted over a million people out of poverty. Shame on them. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, 872,000 Quebecers had to turn to food banks this year. A shocking number. This government absolutely must help these people who can no longer feed their families. During the election, the Liberals promised a billion dollars over five years to fund school lunches. I wrote to the Minister of Finance to remind her of this promise, which has yet to be fulfilled. To date, there's been no response. With one in ten Quebecers relying on food banks, will the Minister keep her promise and spend that money on feeding children? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that right now Canadians, many Canadians, are having a hard time putting food on the table. We are working with provinces, territories, municipalities, Indigenous partners and others to develop a national school food policy and support the creation of a national school food program. We're planning this policy to reflect the regional and local needs because we know that existing meal programs do not serve the majority of Canadians. I'm happy to share with this House that the As We Heard It report will be coming out next week, and I look forward to working together on it. Mr. Speaker, there's no miracle solution to the rising cost of living. We're not asking the government for a miracle today. We're asking it to keep its promise. It promised a billion dollars to feed children in schools. That's not miraculous, but it could make all the difference for 872,000 Quebecers of families who use food banks. When will the government keep its promise and unconditionally transfer the money to Quebec? The Honourable Minister for Families. Speaker, we know that kids learn better on a full stomach, and this remains our goal. 
The work underway on a national school food policy is critical to achieving that. We continue to work with our partners, the province, the territories, Indigenous partners, stakeholders and children to inform the path forward on this. As mentioned, I look forward to the release of the As We Heard It report, the results of our consultation, and I look forward to working with all members in this House to move it forward. Then I have Deputy to Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, Canadians are increasingly convinced that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. This government's insatiable appetite for spending has triggered an inflation crisis and interest rate hikes. Millions of Canadians with mortgages are left wondering what they're going to do when their payments go up by over $1,000 a month on their next renewal. When will this NDP Liberal government get their inflationary deficits under control so people can afford to stay in their homes? I sat with that member on the Federal Finance Committee for two years, Mr. Speaker. At no point did he ever stand up and go against the austerity agenda of that party's leader. It's an unacceptable approach. But we on this side do have an approach that matters. In that community, where he's from, in Calgary, we are working with that city council on a number of things, including the Housing Accelerator Fund, that will see more homes built. That brings down the cost of rent. That brings down the cost of purchasing a home. We will continue to work together, Mr. Speaker. Then I have Deputy to Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. $54 million in waste, extortion, corruption, and an RCMP investigation. That's a rive can. And we heard shocking testimony about a group of government insiders who are running a real racket in the tech sector procurement. After eight years of this Prime Minister and his NDP Liberal government, that's how they run things. And now there's an RCMP investigation. This Prime Minister clearly isn't worth the cost. So will he fully cooperate with the RCMP in this investigation? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we have said time and time again, that we expect all contracts to be issued following the law and regulations set out in this place. Mr. Speaker, CBSA has launched an internal audit. They've increased oversight over contract granting, mandating new procurement cer certification courses. Mr. Speaker, uh, we welcome the, um, any investigation into these allegations. And again, any misconduct will come with consequences. Then I have Deputy to Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. This Prime Minister has blocked so many RCMP investigations that he's lost track of them this week. These insiders involved in this are the same ones behind the $54 million Arrive scam. And the whistleblowers that brought this, this waste and corruption to Canadians' attention were threatened and had their contracts cancelled by the NDP Liberal government. After eight years of this Prime Minister, he's not worth the cost. When will the Prime Minister stop lining the pockets of well-connected insiders and fully cooperate with the RCMP? Mr. Speaker, once again, we see the Conservatives taking cheap political shots at the Prime Minister instead of sticking to the facts, which is allowing any allegations of misconduct to be properly investigated. There is nothing being blocked by the Prime Minister or the government. We welcome investigation to look into these allegations of misconduct. And Mr. Speaker, we expect contracts to be issued following the law. Many Canadians across the country are worried about their future. Groceries are more expensive. Housing and basic amenities cost more too. Among them are many students and recent graduates who are just starting out in life. They face uncertain times and inflation with few savings to fall back on. Can the Minister of Employment and Workforce Development tell us what the government is doing on a practical level to help students and recent graduates put money aside to get a good start in life? 
The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. I want to thank my colleague for Halifax West for her hard work. Our government understands full well that students and recent graduates need support, and that's exactly what we're doing. We recently announced that interest on Canada student loans would be forgiven. This would save young people nearly $410 a year. Our government has always been there for Canadians. I'd like to remind you that the Conservatives voted against this measure. What a shame. Then I have Deputy de Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, new information was just revealed that the Prime Minister's office refused to release documents to the RCMP during their SNC-Lavalin investigation. Wow. At the Ethics Committee, MPs were in the room, the RCMP Commissioner was in the room, ready to testify on the RCMP's obstruction of justice investigation into the Prime Minister's SNC-Lavalin scandal. Then the NDP Liberal government abruptly shut down the Ethics Committee before the RCMP Commissioner could testify. After eight years, this Prime Minister isn't worth the cost. What is the cover-up coalition hiding? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I have to admit, after yesterday's performance, I'm surprised the Conservatives would dare go down this road in dealing with the fact that they had 26 opportunities to move a motion to bring forward the RCMP to committee. But instead, they choose to use that as a political ploy to block the study of looking into a lobbyist paid trip by five Conservatives, including $1,800 worth of champagne. Uh, bill, $1,200 oyster bar bill. Wow. Mr. Speaker, talk about cover up. Yeah. Co colleagues, colleagues, <laughs> I'm certain we all want to give our attention uh, to the member of parliament who has the floor next to ask a question. The honourable member from Co Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, the only person in this place that has broken ethics laws twice is the Prime Minister. That's right. Yeah. And the Prime Minister said when he took office that the government and its information must be open by default. But after eight years, the Prime Minister only wants to cover up the truth. The RCMP Commissioner made himself available to answer questions, but the NDP Liberal government doesn't want him to speak. We've learnt it was the Prime Minister's office who blocked the RCMP from getting key documents during the SNC-Lavalin investigation. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. What is the cover-up coalition hiding? Good question. Good question. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's interesting to me that the Conservatives would once again talk about cover-up when it's they who are using political tactics to block the study of looking into a lobbyist paid trip for five Conservative members. They yelled out, Mr. Speaker, to correct me, it was two lobbyist paid trips. They think that makes it better. Mr. Speaker, I'm curious, was the Chateaubriand that they consumed, was that a a steak or a 600 euro bottle of wine? Perhaps wow. they could come to committee and answer those questions. Colleagues, the Honourable Deputy de Montmagny, Lille, Camorasca, Rivière du Loup. Monsieur le Président, l'Alliance Bloc libéral. The Bloc Liberal Alliance continues. Last Monday at the Ethics Committee, the RCMP Commissioner was in attendance and ready to testify about the Prime Minister's interference in the SNC-Lavalin affair. The Liberals wanted to adjourn the meeting, and who supported them? The Bloc Québécois. The MP for Trois-Rivières voted with the Liberals to protect the Prime Minister. It costs a lot to vote for the Bloc. After eight years of this government, it's doing everything it can to hold on. What did the Prime Minister promise the Bloc Québécois? to get their support. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. You're speaking of costs, I'm just curious, what does a thousand dollar meal at the Savoy restaurant for three courses of a lunch, what does that look like? Maybe the Conservatives who went on a lobbyist paid trip could come to committee and explain that. Instead, Mr. Speaker, they are bringing up a case that the RCMP has considered closed for years as a way to block from the committee studying the exorbitant champagne taste that Conservatives seem to have. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Colleagues, colleagues, colleagues. L'honorable député de Lac Saint Louis. Canada is and always has been a trading nation. Our government's Trade Commissioner Service is an unmatched network of over 1,000 business savvy experts in 160 cities, which help businesses in my riding and across the country reach new markets. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Export Promotion, International Trade and Economic Development update Canadians on how we're helping businesses get started, scale up and go global? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Lac Saint Louis for his strong advocacy on behalf of businesses. I visited two innovative companies in Montreal and heard about how they're growing thanks to our government supports. Opal RT Technologies is unlo unlocking their global potential and now has a presence in over 50 countries. And the EDC has helped Equisoft expand to new markets like the US, Australia, UK, Chile, and South Africa. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to be there for business to help unlock new markets as they create good paying jobs right here in Canada. Bravo. L'honorable député de Churchill Kiwatinuk, excuse me, Churchill Kiwatinuk Aski. Mr. Speaker, as Canadians struggle, a tax evasion report confirms what the NDP has long called for, a global wealth tax to ensure the rich pay their fair share. Still, thanks to Liberal and Conservative governments, billionaires now pay next to nothing in taxes. But rampant tax evasion didn't just happen. It is a political choice. So when will this government stand up for working people and those on fixed incomes who are hurting right now, listen to experts and implement a wealth tax so that billionaires finally pay their fair share. L'honorable secrétaire parlementaire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government has been and will continue to be committed to ensuring everyone in Canada is paying their fair share. That's why we've permanently raised the corporate income tax by 1.5% on the largest banks and insurance companies in Canada, impl implemented a recovery dividend of 15% on the financial sector to pay for the cost of COVID-19, and implemented a luxury tax on private jets, luxury cars and yachts, uh, and will implement a 2% tax on share buybacks. We're committed to ending uh, corporate, the corporate tax race to the bottom and ensuring that multinational corporations pay their fair share of tax wherever they do business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With the Liberal climate policies increasingly looking like Swiss cheese, the Greens have practical solutions, and one of them is Motion 92 from the member for Kitchener Centre to have an excess profit tax on big oil. This was just costed out by the Parliamentary Budget Office, confirming there would be 4.2 billion dollars available if the Liberals move to tax the big polluters. When will this government move to provide an, to create an excess profit tax, as they have done for banking and insurance, on the fossil fuel sector that raked in, the five biggest companies, raked in $38 billion last year? When will we tax it? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for, for her question. In fact, our government has done more than anyone else to ensure that large oil companies do their fair share when it comes to paying taxes and fighting climate change. We already have regulations in place to ensure that they reduce methane emission, very powerful greenhouse gas, by at least 40% by 2025 and at least 75% by 2030. We're, in, we're, we're, in the, we're imposing a cap on the emission of the oil and gas sector, and as my honourable colleague just reminded this House, we've also imposed a surtax on share buybacks. We're doing more than any government has done to ensure that they do their fair share. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And that brings us to an end to our Friday question period. As we move on to daily routine of business, I'll ask members if they can carry their conversations outside of the chamber as we have a number of issues which are going to be brought up by various members. Tabling of documents. Madame la secrétaire parlementaire. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under the uh, Understanding Order 32, I would like to... Uh,